you know, I'd lighten everybody's load if I could, you know, that's unrealistic and you can't. But so as it pertains to fitness, I personally have seen such a tremendous benefit in my own life and in the lives of the people that I'm closest to by incorporating, you know, more of a focus on, you know, health, nutrition, and specifically exercise. So with my knowledge and my love of people and understanding that we all, you know, do tick differently and my belief that, you know, finding the right sort of system for you to, you know, to move your body, to become more healthy, to become more agile. Podcasting from somewhere with protein shakes and no yearly membership fees. This is the Hero Fit Podcast, the show that talks about the ins and outs of fitness, nutrition, and anything else that might get you feeling like a hero. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your hosts, Nick Stutzman and Dan Weber. Hello, and thank you for tuning into the Hero Fit Podcast, where we love to talk fitness, nutrition, and health. Today, we'll be diving into some psychology. I am Dan Weber with my co-host Nick Stutzman, and today we are joined by Sarah Bertolini. Sarah is the founder and president of Type Group. She's a certified practitioner of the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, DISC, and other models of social psychology coaching. She has a genuine interest in people and loves to help her clients understand themselves, connect with others, and experience personal growth. She also helps organizations improve their communication and culture to grow in similar ways. Today, we're going to talk to her about the mental side of fitness and nutrition and using ideas from psychology to find sustainable motivation and achieve your goals. Sarah, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being on. (laughs) You're very welcome. So you come here often? (laughs) Not as often as I'd like. I do like to talk, and this is actually my first first crack at a podcast, so. Well, welcome (laughs) again, and uh, yeah, we hope we... We do well our first time, and for your first time, I should say. So why don't we start by, uh, can you expand a little bit more on your background? I just gave, gave a little bit of a summary there, but how did you get to where you are now? Sure, um, absolutely. So I started into personality psychology and typology about four years ago, um, and it was really kind of a passion project that came along at the right time in my life. So I was formerly in tech sales for 10 years um, and, you know, was pretty successful. I had a good career. I was, my last company, I was working for a phenomenal company um, out of Utica, New York, Northland Communications. And, you know, I just started to feel like it really wasn't lighting my fire anymore. So, and kind of looking at my options and, you know, understanding my background when I was in school, I was a business major. So, um, you know, coming from sales, it was like, do I want to get into engineering or do I want to, you know, take a different path? So in the summer of 2016, a friend of mine had mentioned to me, hey, have you ever taken any sort of personality assessment to kind of just see where you would naturally maybe fit if you were looking to make a career shift? And, Mm -hmm. you know, and and I was familiar, I knew the term Myers-Briggs and DISC, and I'd actually taken both of them in the past. Um, But it didn't really resonate at the time. So, you know, I had taken them through different organizations that I was working for um, and didn't understand what it meant. So to make a long story short, I ended up taking um, an assessment, uh, Myers-Briggs, and uh, in reading through and kind of doing some personal study, I realized, wow, this is really, really powerful. So flash forward to a year, I had everybody that I knew take (laughs) a free online assessment to understand how to better work with them and just Mm -hmm. see kind of how it all fit together was doing my own research and I saw that there was kind of a gap that could be filled by understanding more about yourself, just naturally how you go about doing things, um, you know, how your mind is wired, kind of an internal map of just what you're all about. And so I told my company that I was going to be leaving to pursue a career training on this to companies to help improve their culture as well as just give people more of a tool to understand how they could better drive the results in their lives. That's fun. <laughs> I think so too. Well, t- well, tell us more. So what, I mean, not only with the Myers-Briggs and DISC and all that stuff, but like, you know, what about that kind of gives you a little bit of passion, you know, really fires you up with, with uh, learning. I guess you really, in a sense, you're kind of learning about what, what makes people tick, right? A hundred percent. And, you know, the one thing that I could identify in going into this when people would say, well, what do you like? What do you like to do? Um, You know, it was it was a tough thing for me to say, you know, I knew some of my hobbies, but I really couldn't 
I couldn't say what I was going to be great at, but I knew that I loved people. And so when I kind of reflected back on the successes that I had had in my career, they were all tied to my ability to connect with others. Um, so what really kind of makes me quite passionate about you know personality psychology and in helping people better understand themselves on this level is because I think that it it really drives results for people. And I think that at the end of the day, everybody is, you know, I believe that people are trying to do their best and we all have roadblocks. And what I've realized is sometimes we don't know the ways that we're tripping over our own feet. Um, and myself personally, as well as a lot of the other people that I have worked with and a lot of the clients that I've had, it's like, I know that I'm here, I'm at point A and I'm trying to get to point B. And, you know, there's all of these different routes that I can take but I don't know, you know, I've tried this and I've tried this, but it's just, it's not working for me. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of, there's a lot of resource out there to say what you should be doing and how you should be doing it. But how do you determine which path is the best one for you to kind of wander down? And mm -hmm. so for me, that's, that's what I wanted to give people. And I know that that's what these frameworks have helped me with and additionally help my clients. And that is something that almost anybody who's tried to start or undertake a fitness journey is the exact same question they <laughs> ask themselves. Like, oh, I wanted to, I wanted to lose weight. I was told I need to do this and I started trying to do it and I can't do it or it's not working or whatever. Um, so we'd like to apply some of your expertise to help our listeners with that kind of thing. Yeah. Tell us some of your um, fitness su stories, successes, all this stuff, right? Well, I guess I, w I would start first with your personal fitness background. If you, you know, what that might look like, if any. Sure. You've had some recent success. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So um, I've been working out, I would say, pretty consistently um, for about the past 13 years. I have... You can't see it, but she has big guns. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, and I, I feel like I've tried just about everything. You know, when I when I first got into working out, um, I'll share that I'm, I'm 31. So I was like 18, I think the first time I really stepped foot in a gym. I didn't come from a family where fitness and nutrition was at the forefront. I don't think mm -hmm. either of my parents have probably still ever been in a gym. And so I was kind of like a toddler. I didn't really know what to do and was intimidated a little bit. You know, I, the first gym I joined was Aspen Athletic Club. And, you know, there's the cardio equipment over here. They gave me the tour. And so you fumble around a little bit. And I think that, um, you know, that caused a little bit of anxiety for me. So then I got yeah, into, no, you know. Unfortunately, a typical journey for a lot of people who first start out in the fitness. Yeah, yeah. and, and it, it was definitely for me. I mean, I remember like being too intimidated to even go back in the free weight section because like I, I didn't really know, aside from like <laughs> bicep curls, I didn't really know how mm -hmm. to do anything. So, um, you know, so from there, it kind of just went into cardio, right? That's what I was doing. That was my fitness. I was, you know, running. And so for a while after that, I got into running for a while. Um, I ran a half marathon, which, you know, I was very proud to say that I had done that. Um, I but have not. <laughs> I also didn't love the way that I felt doing it, though. And, you know, I didn't notice it at the time. At the time, it was like I was doing something. So it was mm -hmm. better than nothing. And I remember in training for that and after I ran it, I, I kind of fell off for like, a number of months it was like i achieved it and then i was like oh well, now what's going to get me on the treadmill and I, I did a you know a period of time where i was into crossfit when that was really big and you know that worked for a while but it really i understand now why it wasn't a fit for me um it, because i'm i'm very competitive but i'm competitive only with myself so what is work for me now? I've been doing Orange Theory Fitness now for about six months. And for me personally, I think it's probably the best the best workout that I've found for my personality as well as it's getting me the results that I want. So mm -hmm. the thing I like about Orange Theory and why it works for me is because my personality is one that is not very linear in the way that I take in my information. So in the past, and I've worked with personal trainers as well, you know, they'll, they'll meet with you, they'll go over your goals, and then they'll put together a plan for you based on, you know, whatever it is, whether it's macros for nutrition or, you know, do this workout regimen and this schedule. And I found it very arduous for me to follow. It, it was just, it wasn't, I'd do it for two weeks and then I'd find myself canceling my appointment with my trainer. And then it would be like another three weeks before I'd meet with them again because mm -hmm. I, you know, push them off. So Orange Theory has worked well for me and I found great success in that because of the way that it's structured. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Orange Theory, but it's basically a combination of, you know, I have, I have so maybe a 
I might be able to describe a little bit of how it works. It seems like it's a group fitness class that's maybe probably 45 minutes, a lot of like high intensity interval training. Yep. And, and you know, mixed in with some free weights as well as, you know, it's the rowing and the, and, the rower and, and the treadmill. You, you get uh, a focus on your heart rate. Yes. Yep. You wear a heart rate monitor. And so for me, the reason why I like that is because it's the same. It, you never know what the workout's going to be. It's different. I can drop mm-hmm. into different Orange Theories throughout the country. If I'm traveling, it's going to be the same workout that I would have at my home studio. Um, you know, I like the lighting in there. I mean, it might sound so simple, but the fact that it's it's dimmer lighting, um, they play loud music, and I'm an extrovert. Like a cycling studio almost. Yeah, exactly. Like Barry's Boot Camp or Soul Cycle or something like that. But for me, it's worked well because... I'm a, I'm an extrovert and I have a lot of people around me, but they're not people that I have to worry about engaging into conversation. So sometimes when I would go to mm-hmm. the gym, because I'm a social person, I didn't necessarily go to the gym to be social. You get distracted. Yes. Yeah. And this doesn't <laughs> allow for that. So in additionally, I'm finding that I'm making gains, right? So, you know, I was very proud. I ran a big gains. A big gains. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I ran a mile in six minutes and 42 seconds a couple months ago. And, better than I've ever done. Well, and better than <laughs> I've ever done by leaps and bounds. And, you know, I, I say this not from a place to, you know, to be like, oh, I ran a mile. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you've been... I've worked very hard at it. Yeah. I was running like a 10 minute mile when I started yeah. in January. So like to be able to see that track and when I see, they call it splat points, which is when your heart rate is in a higher level, that is very rewarding. Splat points? That I makes know. sense with their logo now, actually. Yeah, it actually yeah. looks like an orange splat. Yeah, they could come up with a better name, but the workouts are great. So that's where kind of what my fitness journey has been. And so I'm mm-hmm. still doing that. I find that it's not something that I dread going to. I've actually... I like the spontaneity of the workouts. Yeah. You know, the day that I ran the mile, I had no idea I was going to be running a mile that morning, and I had taken like four days off. I was traveling on vacation. Yeah. But the fact that I could come back off after a couple of days off and you know feel good about myself and knew that my body could support it was was really great. There's so much that you said there that I want to like jump off on. One is um, just like the notion of trying different things is kind of like what our our podcast is all about. So you just gave the listeners like another tool or another thing they could try that because we have not gone to orange theory yet we've done a bunch of other classes <laughs> try orange theory i, I, have, not, I have not splatted <laughs> um, but we want people to to do that so they can find what resonates with them hopefully this podcast will help speed up that process for them sure but then the other thing you were talking about was working with a personal trainer i would imagine that different types of trainers are going to have different types of personalities and they might mesh better with different types of clients so you had that was that whatever who you know whoever you were working with probably wasn't a fit um but i also i've always kind of had this like stereotype of personal trainers in my own mind of being very, and I don't like using this word, but a lot of people know what it means is like being very type A. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if you're more of a type B person, you might not always, always mesh well with that um, style of like very regimented, very like black and white, you know, that kind of thing. But not all trainers are are that way. And so the best trainers, I think probably try to understand who the person is in front of them and adapt their style to them. Oh, they should. Yeah. And that's what, in a podcast I was listening to recently with Christian Thibodeau, he says he, he tries to do, he's kind of an empathetic guy. Um, and, and I think too, Dan, that, that there's something to be said about that. Like you mentioned that there's different, you know, personalities of personal trainers as well. And, you know, you can be the best trainer in the world, but that doesn't mean you're going to be the best trainer for everybody. I mean, yeah, I had, I, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> when well, you said best trainer in the world, I just perked up because I'm... <laughs> I happen to be working with someone who I consider one of the best trainers in the world right now. Yeah. Uh, his name's Lee Boyce out of Toronto, and but he he fits my personality really well. Yeah, because we're both kind of spontaneous, and he's able to just coach me on the fly and come up with workouts like on the spot based on what he's looking looking observing and like what he's asked me like how my day and week has been. Yeah, and it's great. But some people might be like really stressed if they don't know what they're getting into going into it. Sure. And, uh, you know, and that reminded me of an instance that happened to me even just at Orange Theory when I was waiting. Um, I, w- I was on the treadmill and I was training for what they call the dry try. So it is a dry triathlon with rowing, running and floor exercises, 400, four, 400 floor movements. And it's it's for time and they do it every March. And I had I was assigned a coach for it who was an Orange Theory employee. And um, while we were in training, I remember I was on the treadmill and I was gassed. You know, it was just one of those days where I wasn't feeling my best. And the trainer came over and she just all she said was, you've got this, Sarah. And all of a sudden it was like a shot of motivation just went through my spine. And I'm like, I do have this. (laughs) And so, you know, there might be other approaches that might have been like, oh, if you're, you know, you're doing great, you know, you know, 
you, you did great even though you got off or even though you stopped here. But Kristen, just very simply coming over and being like, hey, I believe in you. And I'm someone who is very much so motivated by that. So understanding yeah. kind of the type of people that are or the types of characteristics within people and you know right. trainers or anybody that you're working with, I think is really important. But before you can look outward to try to identify who your best trainer or you know coach, whomever might be, I believe that it's really important to kind of know what you're working with and understand kind of how you're wired. Fair enough. Yeah, so that you could better determine yeah, who, you, who might work with you. But what you said just reminded me of an, another thing that I heard from Thibodeau once again. He's just talking about how a different coaching cue that he can give to one of his hockey athletes might devastate his figure skater athlete. <laughs> because Absolutely. the way it's going to be received is a lot differently. So. Wholeheartedly, yeah. Um, so getting into that, talking about personality type, um, let's try and give the listeners something practical and you and like something they can take action on. What do you say to somebody who might be trying to figure out, okay, well, what might resonate with me? Like what kind of person might I be? Do you have like a you know, shorthand at least people can start with? Sure. Um, you know, well, obviously – being, you know, a, a typologist and a practitioner of, so I'm a practitioner of the Myers-Briggs and that is right. one of the tools Which that not everyone is going to be familiar with. Right? Sure. So the Myers-Briggs is a personality index. It's actually the oldest personality index in the world. Um, and it's based on the theory of psychological types, which was a book that was written by Ka Carl Jung in 1921. And the indicator itself. Love Carl Jung. <laughs> he's, for those who, who maybe might not be familiar, he's one of the forefathers of modern psychology with Sigmund Freud. Um, and so he came up with the theory of psychological types, which basically was a way to reconcile the different people patterns that he was seeing and experiencing. Um, and then in the 40s, the Myers-Briggs indicator came about when a mother-daughter team came together and said, hey, we should kind of make a tool for this. They were young enthusiasts as well. And so that's how the first assessment tool came to be. So I okay. would advise anybody who's maybe setting out on a journey and maybe has had some you know, stumbles when it comes to their fitness journey or really anything else, I encourage people to learn more about themselves. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there about different personality assessments, and I completely understand them. They're not gospel. So the purpose of the assessments are to develop a map, in my opinion, and this is what I tell my clients. So if I gave you, if you, let's just take New York City, for example, if you've never been to New York City in the past, and, you know, let's, you know, just pretend like we don't have maps in our hands, right, in our phones mm -hmm. nowadays, the map would only do you so much good. So it would give you somewhat of an idea of how to get around, but it's not going to show every landmark and everything that's happening because things are changing right. so often. And that's really where I feel that personality assessments come in. They're kind of like maps. So they give the individual clues about how they're wired. I mean, if I threw you a pencil right now, Nick, and I said, hey, sign your name with this, you'd pick up the pencil and you'd probably sign your name with your eyes closed, correct? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're ambidextrous, though, if I told you to sign it with your non-dominant hand, you'd probably have to think about it a little bit more so in the yeah. capacity of trying to, if you were trying to make it look legible. Perhaps. It would probably look the same, actually. Oh. <laughs> My signature is a snowflake. No one's the same. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I'll say uh, mine would be completely different. I yeah. struggle with yeah. my left hand. Yeah. Or or the or the yeah. or the, if I were to throw you a ball, you typically are going to catch it with one hand. There we go. Yeah. Right. So that is what the theory of psychological types is. So it is just inborn characteristics and traits about how we take in information and come to trust that information and then how we use the information that we take in to make informed decisions. And then the last bit of it that this system pulls out is how we might apply that to our roles and, and our just our lives. And the nice thing that I like about it and where I think that this will play into fitness, it's probably fairly easy if I were to say, hey, you know, Dan, tell me, you know, what some of your strengths are. It's easier for us to identify our strengths than it is for us to identify our blind spots because they're blind to us. But oftentimes the things that are encapsulated in the blind spots are areas that we trip over in different capacities of our life that we don't necessarily know why. And to put a little bit more context around that, taking myself, for example, I am someone who I am very spontaneous by nature. Um, I, I rather like 
a little bit of unpredictability in my life. I find that when I'm very, you know, scheduled and hemmed in and, okay, this is what you have to do at this time or, you know, this is the workout plan, you know, that you're going to follow on Tuesday and this is when you follow on Thursday, mm. I kind of get bored with it. And I am someone that is going to do a little bit better if I have more space to be spontaneous around that. Mm -hmm. Now, understanding that not everybody is wired like that, you can imagine how not just in fitness, but that kind of admiration for spontaneity and yeah. not having a plan can rub people the wrong way. I can resonate with that <laughs> and say that I'd probably be similar. Yeah. But I can think of people that would probably get really stressed out about that. A hundred percent. And it's not a right or a wrong thing. But mm -hmm. if I then try to apply, you know, if I'm if I'm working with someone who is not like that, and they're getting super, super irritated about the fact that I'm just like, no, I think we're going to do this now. And I think we're going to mm -hmm. do this. I don't mean to make myself sound like a leap in the wind. I do have some semblance <laughs> of structure, but it's like organized chaos to quote, you know, what Nick said a little bit earlier in our, when we were chatting before the podcast. So in bringing this all back, if you can understand better the tendencies that you have and the characteristics that you have that are in your blind spots and then you know take a step back yourself and look and see how those might be impacting you know your relationships your life your success um how you're achieving your goals then you can become more aware of when you're tripping over yourself so in my mm -hmm. case it was when i was trying to follow these workout plans with these trainers and i wanted to gouge my eyes out with rusty spoons because i didn't want to do back every you know other thursday or whatever it was I knew that there needed to be some system and some sort of structure, right? Or I can't just do biceps every day, which you guys probably <laughs> noticed I've been doing. <laughs> and if you want to do biceps every day, follow me on Instagram <laughs> at Dancegrams. I do a lot of bicep workouts. But, do, but is that the failure of the the trainer not knowing how to – that you're not a bodybuilder or you don't want to be a bodybuilder per se and that you don't want to do back on Thursdays, you know, stuff like that? Or do you think that that was you not having the experience to know what you wanted? Well, I'm going to, I guess that's a two-sided answer. So I'm going to say that I am the type of person that I, I hired this trainer. So I said, I'm going to pay you to train me on this and you're the expert. However, if I didn't really, going into it, if I couldn't say, hey, I'm not going to stick to a plan that's so linear like this, or this isn't going to be good for me. I didn't know that at the time. It just wasn't working. And I spent a lot of money with a trainer and I didn't really get the results. I mean, I got some, mm -hmm. but not as good. Of course, if I would have stuck to that plan, it probably would have been better, but that's, it was challenging for me. And yeah. so it became more work and I didn't. Yeah. So I would say that, is it the trainer? I think that it's the trainer's job too, to, to read their client. But if their client can't really understand where they're coming from and it's like, oh man, Russ, I'm so glad that you gave me this plan. This looks awesome. Yeah, I'm going to stick to this. And in six months, well, sure. If I stuck to that plan, I probably would have been ripped like Rambo in six months. It mm -hmm. just, I had the best of intentions. And I think when it comes to fitness goals, I think when Usually in my experience, when I start a plan and, you know, people that I know when they start a plan, we're really fired up. Yeah. But it loses steam with some of us. And I think that the areas where it's losing steam, that's where people could kind of try to focus their efforts on what's making you lose steam. So it's, it's just figuring out your goals then. Figuring out your goals, but furthermore, how to... people know what their goals are and they get frustrated and they get frustrated with themselves because they end up not being able to achieve their goal because they you know, they, maybe they don't stick to it or whatever. The consistency isn't there and there could be a new number of factors, but it could just be that they're trying to do something that just isn't compatible with them personality wise. If you're to, if you were to listen to some of the other theories that are out there, it also just might not be compatible with them physiologically mm -hmm. or the bi environment biologically. Like, you know, some people aren't built to do a lot of volume. Some people might not be built to do like explosive movements. Some people are more endurance based. So um, there's so much they can, go into it from all different angles but one of the mental things is and we hear it all the time people they don't they get frustrated with themselves for not necessarily being able to stay disciplined mm -hmm. or motivated and those are two different things of course but of course yeah um yeah so you could identify maybe what does motivate you or maybe at least identify what doesn't motivate you and help start eliminating some things like i know i'm not going to do well with yes this like yep. Or, and, and, and I try not to put things in such hard boxes, right? So mm -hmm. that's one of the, um, I will say like the digs or the limitations of any sort of personality assessment or personality index. 
right. you know, you can go online or how, however you might choose to do it and take this and, and get a report back that gives you characteristics about your personality. You know, we were talking earlier about um, astrology and just kind of joking. You know, when you read a horoscope, for example, it, the joke is that you can always apply it like to your life in some form or facet. Mm -hmm. And that can be said as well with any of these personality assessments, right? However, it's the intention of why you're taking it. And I think that there's a, a very real focus in today's culture on mindfulness um, and self-awareness. But what does that really mean? You know, I, I mean, there's tons <laughs> of different definitions out there. And I think everybody kind of holds their own and, and all of them are probably right and wrong in their own capacities. Mm -hmm. But you're taking the assessment with the intention of better understanding how you're wired. And then it's the person who's taking it's job to kind of distill that information and then take a look at their life. So you're going to get out of it what you put into it. You know, Nick mentioned something about putting, whether it's MBTI type or, you know, DISC or your, your strengths and strength binders or, you know, big five, whatever, and applying these to like different social websites. And I am fundamentally against this as well, because I think that, you know, in the Myers-Briggs system, it produces a four letter type code, but it's like a decoder ring. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, just because I have preferences that the code is ENFP, that everything that you read about an ENFP is going to describe Sarah or all ENFPs. Mm -hmm. You know, I like going back to the map reference of New York City, people are dynamic and they're ever changing. Mm -hmm. But the theory of psychological types specifically states that it's it's inborn. We're, we're kind of, we change and we evolve and we grow, but how we take in information and how we come to trust that information and then how we use it to make our decisions and apply it to our lives is pretty foundational. I, I, I'm almost looking at it like a subway map in particular. Yeah. It's like the wiring. Yes. Right? And then, but you don't know necessarily what's layered on top of that. And there could be different types of tests can layer different types of maps on top until you start getting a clearer picture. And then yeah. even then you got the subtleties of the individual. So, yeah. And so it's, it's not to be used to broad, in my opinion. Um, and what, what I, what I teach in my practice is it's not to be broadcasted out that I'm Sarah, the ENFP, like this is how you operate with me. Mm -hmm. It's to give, when I took the assessment, it was to ascertain more knowledge about just how I am that maybe I wasn't looking at myself that way, you know? And, you know, I joke that we're all assholes in our own right. And, you know, it's sometimes hard for people to call you out on it. You know, when people are upset with you, you know, sometimes if, you know, they care enough to share with you, but we don't, we, we don't have a metric for really knowing how we're tripping over our own feet. And so when I got into mm -hmm. this and I really am so passionate about it is because I think that we all have room for growth and it, and it's a, it's a journey. It's not a destination. Right. And these are just more tools that if used correctly, um, and applied correctly, and I think that that's the second part, is applied correctly, they can be very, very powerful, but they can also be dangerous if they're applied incorrectly. <laughs> yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, I assume if you apply them correctly, And that's why too, I have a business. <laughs> <laughs> to help people apply them correctly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that we can better respect one another and understand the, the strengths and weaknesses per se without, you know, of our uh, our own, really yeah. more so than anything. It's really more an individualistic approach, you know. So that I, you, so that I can say, you know, I might have a blind spot here, and this is, I find myself getting frustrated in these situations. Perhaps I could do this instead because, sure. you know, that's not normally in my wheelhouse, or that's not my natural inclination. But if I, if yeah. I change this a little bit, maybe I can, you know, get along with my colleagues better. Is that am I on the right path here? Oh, I mean, I think I think so. Yeah, I, I mean, it's. It all, it all comes back to really how well we, I don't want to say know ourselves because I really don't like that term, but how well we just understand how we interact with our world. Um, you know, and that's fitness. That, that's our personal relationships. That's the culture of which, you know, we're, the cultures of which we're a part of, whether it be, you know, familial or work. So it, it gives you it gives tools and mm -hmm. the information that is distilled from there. It, for me, it's been a, just a bottomless pit. And I always say that you can't, I'm not the one who coined this phrase, but you can't, you don't really unlearn things. You can forget certain things, but like with myself and learning more about kind of my tendencies and just the way that I'm wired, I know when I am, I know now, like, you know, let's say if, you know, I'm scheduled for a class at Orange Theory and you know, maybe I've had an off morning or whatever, or I ate a bunch of garbage the night before and I'm just feeling like a load. 
I know that it's not that I'm falling off the wagon now because I didn't go for a couple days or maybe I've had, you know, some personal situations or something going on and just kept me from there. I no longer now feel like, oh, you know, Jesus, I can't stick to anything, which is something that I used to really struggle with is that because I'm, my personality is one that is, you know, that spontaneity and really, you know, interested in so many different things and not loving routines that I used to get very, very down on myself about my abilities to, you know, complete things. And so now in knowing that about myself, that it's not that I am inept or that I am less than than anybody else who might do it a different way, perhaps more regimented, but it's understanding my own way and then learning how to work within that and seeking out um, if I need maybe assistance or if I need to learn more about this in order to better reach my goals. Now I understand that it's, I'm not dealing with kind of that mental trash. It's not that I'm defective or that I'm, you know, a failure or that I, you know, I suck or I'm lazy. It's that, okay, well, I know that when I get overwhelmed and if I have a lot of personal things going on, you know, I'm someone who is very, you know, subjective and I'm, I'm a feeler. So I'm very empathetic. And if I have a lot of things that are going on in my personal life, that can really detract me from other things, my workouts included. And now when that's happening, I'm aware of it. And so it no longer hijacks the whole train and Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, go off and don't work out for six months, which in the past, in the past 13, 14 years, I've been working out. That's happened a number of times. And then that would perpetuate further feelings of inadequacy within me. So you, you're mm-hmm. learning a little bit about yourself about self-regulation, essentially, uh-huh. or oh. auto-regulation. In a yep. sense. Yes, and how to how to kind of govern myself in, in different situations for me, for my goals, not for others' agendas. I mean, you have to, of course, factor in the perceptions of others. It's not a selfish thing, but I believe that we are in charge of our own trains. And if you don't know how you're wired and you're expecting other people to adapt to you, I just think that that's kind of faulty logic. Mm-hmm. especially if you don't know and there are some you people you can't change the rest of the world necessarily. you can't change what you don't know yeah. and i think a lot of times it's that people don't realize kind of i don't want to say why they are the way that they are because there's tons of reasons as to why our, how our personalities are shaped obviously our environment being a huge one our upbringing um the communities and such that we grow up in and where we choose to live and the things that we're interested in however It's beyond just surface level, I believe. I think really, you know, and getting back and mentioning psychological types again, how you've come to understand, and it's not just learning, but it's how you take in information when it's presented to you best, how you understand that, how you trust that, because trust is is a huge thing. And then how, what factors go into play for making your decisions of whatever you do. I'm just thinking. Okay. (laughs) Um, Dan's an introvert, so he has to take a little bit of time to post-process all that I've just said. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> and I only know this because I work with you in the past. <laughs> that's the kind of thing I want to dive more into. <laughs> I don't know if it's appropriate or not. Um, but like, is there any? Can there be maybe one example you might be able to pull out of like, you know, there's there's a two types of people. Let's say, <laughs> like, sure, there's this type of person and there's this type of person. Maybe maybe I can identify. Uh, it sounds like if someone's like that, they might like these kinds of workouts. And it sounds like, sure. someone, well, I, I don't or know. even how about this? How I'd, can how can you properly assess or get assessed so that you can find out this type of thing? Well, uh, you know, you can certainly call typed. My website is typedgroup.com. <laughs> or you know, you can go online, and I encourage everybody to do their independent research. So there's a lot of kind of mucky information out there, but start somewhere. So I'm mm-hmm. not someone that is like, oh, you have to take a personality assessment. But right. yeah, I how, don't think you necessarily have no, to. No, you, you, you absolutely don't. We're just don't. talking about understanding ourselves more. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, once you do that, you can understand maybe other people more too. And you can just be nicer to yourself is what I'm gathering but, from what you just said. But not but. everybody has an emotional intelligence like that, though. I don't think you're born with it. I don't think no. it's just something you have overnight. I feel like sometimes we, like can't, we can't always figure out what were our strengths or weaknesses are. So, so I think that there are at that point you to, can dive into those assessments and tools probably. And I, and I think that I think they're a starting point. Feedback so, from others. Yeah. I mean I encourage everybody to play around with it. I mean most people have access to the internet. If they're listening to this podcast, they have access to the internet. Um, you know, sixteen personalities dot com is a kind of a knockoff Myers Briggs thing. And any of these are gonna give you information that, you know, if you take it in and you really think about it it doesn't have to be so technical. So in my practice, I dive into more of the cognitive functions behind type, which are 
a little bit more complicated in nature, um, but the information is out there. So I encourage everybody to give it a shot. Try it. I mean, it, you might hate it. You might say, oh my God, this is nothing like me. But understanding that with all of these assessments, there's a certain degree of, um, for lack of better words, bullshit that goes into them when you're taking them because we see ourselves a certain way and other people see us away. So to say, you know. And what's the right way? Well, the right way, what I tell people is answer from your gut. Like don't, and that, and that's, and I'm sure you're looking at me like, well, there's a huge gray area there and you're absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely correct. I mean, some people uh, have, are very delusional. (laughs) <laughs> and they absolutely are. And, you know, and those are the people that, you know, they're probably going to have a little bit more of an uphill battle. So, I mean, to, to kind of mm, take it into good point. what I do and how I deal with, you know, people that I work with that maybe are like that. And I probably 30 to 35 percent of my clients, I feel, are like that. It's walking them through because I, I personally, as a practitioner and having done this for hundreds of people, I can usually spot when people are wanting to be a perfect type. Or or, I'm sorry, not a perfect type, but a particular type. Or a type of like somebody who they, someone who they like a lot or admire or someone or the expectation of what someone who they admire wants them to be. Or their friend or their whatever. Or the, or the mask that we, that we're conditioned to wear. I mean, listen, in society, we all have to be different people. Everyone needs to drop their masks. Stop with the bullshit. That's be honest. A, that's not always Be possible. honest with no, yourself and others, don't, please. I don't agree, Dan. I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to side with Nick here on this one, Dan. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> I'm all about authenticity. That's something I'm very passionate about. But what the hell is authentic anymore? Like, what's authentic to you and you might not be authentic to me and vice versa. So it's, it's coaching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that is okay. There's not a right or a wrong, but it's coaching Living people to life. understand. You know, when I sit through, but they're called, when I take people through the Myers-Briggs system, I they get the report. Mm-hmm. I review it with them and we determine if that's actually what they're like. And, you know, oftentimes I can tell when people are like, yep, yep. And sometimes I'll be honest with you. Um, sometimes people just don't care and you cannot, mm-hmm. uh, some people, some people just don't give a fuck. They're like, probably not listening to this podcast. Yeah, they're probably not. And, you know, <laughs> and if you've gotten this far, you might care, but, and I, and I have, I don't try to change people. I don't try to push this on anybody. But I, more so, I try to show them where the value could be. And it's not yeah. what I often say when I'm doing this with companies is this isn't to identify how this isn't to, how, how to, you can pigeonhole other people. No, or... <laughs> exactly. But it's not to identify how you can necessarily work better with others, although that is a byproduct of it and learning how, you know, everybody's on the team kind of is and what their different preferences are. But what I tell people that are really strong, kind of like naysayers, like, I don't give a shit, I am how I am, and you're not going to change me, is, well, do you find that you get what you want from people all the time? Nobody's going to get what they want from people all the time. But how are your results in um, influencing others? We all influence every day, you know, whether we, we're in a career that has any some of the sales or customer service. But even if it's, you know, trying to get, you know, your partner to go to the restaurant that you want to, you know, imposing those arguments. So by understanding oh kind of how you're made up, it's like, ah, OK, so this is how, what I'm working with. You can be you naturally become more aware of those who are not like you. And so then it's just kind of diving into if you want to. And I am someone who believes that connections with others is really how we find our success for the most part. Um, it's it's just to me, it's just gold. So it's it's not about getting you working better with others is what I tell the people. It's about how to better articulate or get across your message or whatever it is that you're trying to do and have that be received in the way that you want it to be received. So that's kind of where it goes with the typology among communications, if that makes sense. No, and I think, like I said, people, I I, I don't want to, I'm trying to focus on the negatives. I just think that that's it's okay. not as easy as it seems. It's because, not. Um, because it's just not, uh, yeah, if it was everyone I guess we would all be, we would all know our own types or we would all, I think also too, people change. They do change. Uh, Whether or not it's from traumatic experiences or from other mental health or whatever the case may be. Um, You know, it just kind of sucks that that's, that happens too. So uh, I don't know, especially when it comes to fitness, I've, you know, we've, we just had a podcast where we discussed about mental uh, health and, and just kind of 
you know, bringing that about. And I think with this and we're trying to have people figure out what they are, it's tough because like I said, it's, it's, uh, being honest with yourself. I'm all about it. Authentic. You're you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you might, you just might not know yourself as well as you think. And I think that that's the majority of the population. Yeah. But I would argue with you that, so what, how would you, if you had to guide someone who was, you know, going down a fitness path, but had found that they had failed in multiple different attempts, but they really wanted it. And what would you advise them to do to help them identify what their best track is? Lots of the, I mean, there's lots of subjectivity to that question. I think, you know, you would have to really kind of map out what have they done? What have they tried and what they haven't tried? And then kind of then figure out from there, okay, well, you know, what did maybe get gather little bits and pieces of what, didn't didn't work for them you know what i mean and then try to structure it from there perhaps i'd ask them a lot of questions about their life and try to figure yeah. out what makes them tick it'd be a try map to connect that to yeah but you, like she said it'd be a map of sorts yeah You'd and i to... mean that's that's in a way you know that's... i don't want to call it i'm not gonna call it an assessment but those sort of conversations I'll point you in the are, right direction yes and that's what i'm all about is helping right. people get in that direction so Fair enough. i don't always think that not everybody and myself included um we're not always asking the questions in the best way. And you could say the exact same thing that you could say, Nick, and I might hear it better from Nick than I hear it from Dan. So it's it's more learning what you respond to. And so we don't know ourselves, but we have to start somewhere. And oftentimes, you know, people Agreed. are just dig their heels in and they continue trying, whether it be the same things or the same gym or nope, you know, my mother is. Well, a lot of people try to do what other people tell them they should do. Or, or what other people have done. By. Yeah. And yes. I have a problem with that because I think something I've been preaching in the last couple of podcasts here is that people can take ownership of this for themselves mm -hmm. and figure it out and take their own path and kind of like fuck the haters. Like if this is starting to work for you, keep going. Right. And then, you know, don't uh, someone says that doesn't work. So I stopped doing it or whatever. Like, I don't know. So. Trust in yourself, I think, a little bit. Go inside yourself and also trust that, like, if you're honest with yourself, that it will lead to something good. Like, I think some people are afraid to to tell the truth to themselves. Like, oh, I think that that's I, I think that that's a very true statement. And to tell the truth to others. like I think most people don't know what big, their truth is. I, and I have a big problem with that at, at, with society at large right now. Like, people <laughs> are not honest. And... And I don't necessarily mean that they're liars. No. <laughs> I mean that they're not being like, they're not saying what's true for them because they might not even know what's true for them because they're almost afraid to even face it in a sense. That's just the negative aspect of it. But then there's so much positive that I think that can come from, from that pursuit. But anyway, I'm going to go off the rails here. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I don't know if you have anything to contribute. If not, I have a question. We can. No, I okay. ask So away. are there any other... Um, assessments or tools or books or things like that that you think help people on this like journey of like understanding themselves and trying to pull the like positive benefit from it mm -hmm. okay. um absolutely so i am a besides hiring you <laughs> besides hiring me that's so probably the first place to, yeah, first place to start um i joke but you know you don't necessarily need to be working with a practitioner to understand yourself you know i'm more so focused on companies and you know helping shift cultures in my business mm -hmm. um my passion is people though and those cultures are made up of people so as far as you know other you know things that one could do to kind of dive further into kind of what they're like and what might work for them and stuff like that there's a lot of great podcasts out there i mean i can recommend um Personality Hacker podcast is a great one. That one is I kind like of strictly them. into typology. Um, so it might be a little bit high level. Um, you might want to go back. I think there's like 250 episodes, but there's a lot of great content in there. There's also a ton of great books that are not typology, Jungian typology books. Um, I'm a huge Robert Greene fan. Um, the Art of Human mm. Nature is one of my favorite books. And I would encourage every human being to <laughs> to read that because he really breaks down kind of the human psyche in just a very fundamental way. And he puts it with historical references. Um, so I like Robert Greene. Um, He's very smart. I haven't read that book, but I want to. Yeah. And, you know, and there's, there's other ones as well. But I think like recommending literature and, and, and books to read is a little bit of a tough one. So I could name ones that I like, <laughs> but they might not be ones that others might get a lot out of. So I mm -hmm. like The Art of Human Nature. Um, 
I love another book called The Art of Possibility, which is by Benjamin Zander, um, and he is a conductor of the Boston Philharmonic. I would recommend that book for people who are maybe struggling to give themselves permission. Um, I think in our culture, there is a lot of people that are waiting or or kind of in, in kind of a trying to think of the best way to say this, but almost like a mental purgatory. They put a lot of limiting beliefs on themselves. So Mm -hmm. this would be a book that I would recommend to people that were maybe a little bit more compassionate, more empathetic in nature, that were looking not just for like a shot of motivation and a feel-good book, but actual with real references behind it. And that one's a pretty quick read. So I would just say, you know, do your homework. I I, I mean, again, I'm going to, I'm going to lean on that. I think that the assessments are a great place to start any, I won't say any assessment, but Um, you know, DISC is another one that I use. I use that more with my corporate clients and that's more of a behavioral assessment. Um, I don't think it tells you as much, but that is a way that you might be able to see, learn a little bit more about how you act in, you know, social settings. I would say that one is where the MBTI or the Myers-Briggs is more kind of how you're wired. DISC DISC is more how you behave. And Strength Finder is another, is another great one too. They can help you identify, you know, what, some of your top strengths are and put a little bit more clarity around them. Um, and additionally, I like Gallup Strength Finder because it also dives into it, people who have the specific strengths. And there's like, I think, 34 of them. They rank them in order for you, but also build out a little bit more about what a strong suit in those strengths look like. So, Dan, I think you have some familiarity with Strength Finder a little bit too. Um, and like for a myself. A little bit. I took it. Yeah. And, you before. know. My number one, when this goes right in alignment with what I do and what I'm passionate about, my number one strength is connectedness, you know, believing that everything is kind of interconnected in the world and, you know, my passion for people and, you know, my my true belief that, and I don't mean that every person is good. I don't mean, I'm not that altruistic, but I do believe that the majority of people just want to lead, you know, successful, happy lives. And whatever that looks like to them. I mean, and it's going to be look totally, totally different. And I believe that the first, one of the first steps in really understanding what that looks like for you is understanding what that looks like for you. Fair enough. Makes, <laughs> sense. Makes sense. I'm not the expert here, but I actually was, while you were talking, You're over four, there things came to, <laughs> four things came to mind as like things that I think might like help people as well. So, and the mm-hmm. first one is going to be you might laugh at, but the movie Crash. Oh gosh! Because I think on a very superficial basis, you're just gonna sad movie. You're gonna understand that you shouldn't make assumptions about people that we're not all the same, and that we all have some sort of complex yeah story, story. going on. And it's you know so there's a, your entertainment value for those that don't read, and, and if you want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and now this is one's going to be like on the way other side of the spectrum. It's a book, so you have to want to read first of all, and then the second thing is that it's. Uh, there's audiobooks too. I don't know, I don't know if esoteric is the right word, but it's a, it might be a little bit out there for some people. But it's a book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He basically interviewed all these rich, successful people back in the 1920s, and he tried to figure out what was similar between all of them and then wrote a book about it. They all had the last name Carnegie. <laughs> and, uh, so that book is like, it's about like belief in yourself and your own mental programming. So if you are someone that like, has negative self-talk, maybe that would help you. Yeah. Uh, then the big five is another personality mm-hmm. assessment that yes, people can take, absolutely. which I'm more familiar with than Strengths Finder. Um, the big five is a great one, and they use that. So the big five is another personality index, but they also will use that in clinical at times is where right. like the Myers-Briggs it's and the a DISC bit, is It's not got a little bit more like support science, by, yeah. from scientists, yep. right? Absolutely. And then finally, if we're tying it back to fitness, since we're the Hero Fit podcast. Um, <laughs> Mentally neuro, fit is a thing as well. Neurotyping which is a system Christian Thibodeau uh, has been developing for the last couple of years. I'm fascinated by it, but he basically identifies that there's five different types of people in a sense from a, from a fitness and nutrition standpoint. Um, and he bases it on what neurotransmitters are more uh, dominant in that person. Mm-hmm. And that can help you kind of figure out what workouts might work for you and what diets might work for you. Sure. So, Absolutely. There you go. I'm not as familiar. I'm not familiar with that gentleman, um, I'm very interested. I wouldn't, in that, though, so yeah, I wouldn't imagine you. You should be, or would, well, maybe you should be, but maybe that you would be. Yeah, <laughs> we all should be, because I think he's a very smart guy. He's got a lot to offer the world. 
we'd like to have him on the podcast someday. So you I'm think that we should right be now. because of your preferences and what you like and you are interested in, though. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> very much so. Yeah. I have a strong stop, bias towards myself. I'm trying to press everything on you. <laughs> I have a strong bias towards myself, my things. And I just, I want to clarify one thing that I'm, I'm, I want to make sure that this is clear. So I do not believe that in order to understand, you know, yourself, you have to fall into a personality profile. Right. I don't at all. No. It's People a tool. People have been doing it for years. Yeah. Now. It's a tool for those who are looking for a tool to better understand why they do what they do and how they can maybe attack their goals from a different perspective that will actually work for them that conceptually could actually work for them. It's almost like um, it narrows down maybe some of the paths and there's all of these, I mean, we live in a world of opportunity, right? Everything's right at our fingertips for the most part. We can find information. So the options, you know, we can get, some people can get, you know, what is it, Parkinson's law, analysis paralysis, like, well, what do I do? I could do this. I could do this. Yeah. Paralysis by overanalysis. Yeah. Or whatever that is. And, (laughs) you know, I think that if you better understand how you're wired, you can kind of sift out well i don't i haven't tried this but that's probably not going to work even though you know the top fitness experts are saying that this is the new thing you know crossfit mm-hmm. had a boom for a moment right and you know it still has its moments it has it's, its like, moments and, and a lot of things can work of course but what maybe what's a path that you should right that you might try or that you might find that you maybe could i don't want to use the word easier because i don't think any of this is easy. maybe a, it, yeah i mean it might uh, motivate you more it might make you feel better it might enliven you or it might yeah. be easier to recover from however you want to say it sure you know when we talk about personal growth dan one of the things that in, in preparing for this podcast that you um i don't remember where i read it but in talking about when people see results in fitness so when you you know, when you set out on a fitness journey, whatever that might look like for you in a nutrition journey, a journey to be healthier, um, there's usually some sort of results that you're looking looking for, whether it's weight loss, um, you know, maybe it's to physically tone up to become stronger um, or just to feel better. You know, there's, there's a mm-hmm. myriad of different reasons. Mm-hmm. But usually, you know, in best case, people set out because they want to see results. So I find that I believe that like with personal development, with fitness, when you start to see that there's some success happening, human nature, you're going to want more of that. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like getting you down a path where things are, you know, are starting Starting to to, come together, starting to click. And so like with fitness, when you start to see results, you know, you start to feel better. Usually it's not, oh, I've seen results. No, I'm going to sit back on the couch and eat potato chips for the next three weeks because I, you know, I lost. It gives you more positive motivation. Exactly. It can snowball. Yeah. In the right direction. Especially if you're doing something that works in line with your values and your strengths and instead of trying to go and flex yourself in a way that might be, you can do it for a couple of weeks, but you might get burnt out. Yeah. That's what I think. It's kind of where I'm trying to circle into, but it might be a separate conversation. You know, I know that in my whole fitness journey for the most part, you know, I'm a woman in her early 30s, you know, society you know, you always have to be thinner, 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 right? So before I really got into understanding what works for me and I started working out at Orange Theory, um, and, you know, and even before that, my goals are completely different now. So... Yeah, well, I was... <laughs> we could go down a whole rabbit hole of goals. Yeah. Why is that your goal? It, well, why, that, and when, why do you think you saying that? Like, <laughs> what's the real reason you want to do this? Right. <laughs> and it's almost like I had to, like, like an onion, peel back, like you know, the weight thing, it was never really, I mean, I was, I've never been overweight in my life. It was, but it was that that's why you work out. You work out to stay in shape, to stay fit. And really now where I find the benefits for me and I can accept them now because I realize that, yeah, there's the byproducts of, you know, you stay fit or whatever, you know, your clothes fit, you feel better. But for me, fitness has taken on a whole new meaning. It's a mental thing now. And I realized that I ding, 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 ding. I found I've when I I mean I just I notice it more so now when I go don't go to the gym for a few days do I sit here and you know say oh geez Sarah you suck like you know whatever or if I have you know a weekend where I enjoy myself and you know I go to concerts and I'm drinking beers or whatever I don't get down on myself because I know that my it my goal with fitness now is to be healthy and healthy is is moderation um knowing what works and what doesn't but it's even had a mental side effect with me where now where I choose to get like my dopamine is from my workouts. I mean, mm-hmm. when, I, when I leave Orange Theory and I immediately get on my phone, 
the report of, you know, the calories I've burned, the miles that I've ran, um, where my heart rate was, my, my splat points, which is, you know, when you're <laughs> over 85% of your heart rate or whatever. It's not the it's not the validation in reading that report that makes me feel good. It's 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 the feeling within me. And that's I think for me personally, that's the best thing that I could ask for because it keeps me coming back. Well, there's a lot of mental health benefits to fitness that I'd like to do a podcast on someday. Um separate, but yeah, that's a that's a great that's a great reason. I think that's also I would imagine gonna help you not fall off the wagon to use a strange phrase. But, yeah. Because you're like I want to go back and get that like positive boost. Yeah, I'm not I, just doing I'm it to, to lose getting. five pounds. So a lot of people, I think, can't stick to whatever they're doing because they're doing something that they dread. Yeah. I don't want to drag myself to the gym and lift these stupid weights. Okay, well, maybe whatever you're doing, however you're doing it, isn't like in line with what's going to work for you. So something else will that's maybe exercise related. You're not. You're going to feel better. You're going to start getting healthier. You're going to have a, like a better mental outlook on life then everything's going to snowball in a positive way and then the side effect is some of the aesthetic stuff exactly but and it's not to say that people who are going into the gym or whatnot you know wanting to look better and feel better about themselves are wrong you know that right. was that truly might be you know that certain people's motivations i was just clouded in mine and didn't know it mm -hmm. and so that's why i and, had a hard time sticking and if those motivations it. are based in some sort of like shame or like negativity then it also might not stick sure as much i think yeah what do you and, think, Nick? Uh, well, I was also going to say I think that those are also indicators, and it's almost like a behavioral science type thing where you're seeing your splat and you're seeing your these different um, types of data or variables, whatever you want to say, and that also helps to push you towards your goals or at least making you feel better about what you're doing. Sure, yeah. absolutely. I would, I would say that's goal-directed creatures. Mm -hmm. They're nudging you. <laughs> that's another book i have um, not read it but nick said to read nudge yes you must you <laughs> there's must. And one of the i think like we're going to wrap up now but one other thing i wanted to add is that knowing what your strengths are i think also can help you find forge a path for yourself in a positive way that's going to be a little bit like of an easier road than maybe if you had gone a different direction and discover that there's 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 different ways to get things done there's different types of leadership like i think that's a good thing to circle in on is I read a book one time about all these different great leaders throughout history and mm -hmm. how they all did it differently and they kind of all did it their own way. Um, so you don't have to necessarily follow like a, a template. Once again, trust yourself, figure you, you can do things your way and it can work out. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the, I think that again, to come back to that word of mindfulness or awareness um i think that the best leaders um and the people that go on to do for the most part um strange landscape in our country right now um but mindfulness and awareness i think are the keys to great leadership and no tremendous <laughs> exactly and uh <laughs> and you know when you can there's there's not like a secret sauce for that right and it looks different to everybody but if you can make a commitment to yourself to understand what that looks like for you, I think that you're already on your way to becoming, you know, a strong leader. At least that's a, that's a good starting point for those who are looking to either improve, um, you know, their, their, I don't want to say skills, but their leader, their leading abilities or leadership. Um, and also people who maybe aren't in quote unquote yeah, role. Yourself. Yeah. Like lead, leading your life, lead by yeah. example and that's being able to feel yeah. good about how you're showing up. Bring in your A game. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we are going to wrap this up, and I'm going to give you some shotgun questions. Oh, jeez. You did not see beforehand. Okay. And that printout. So. <laughs> uh, Little did you guys know, this is entirely scripted. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, not to mention. We're all spontaneous. You've, over here. <laughs> you've listened to a episode, so you might have heard these. But you probably don't remember. So I that's what's definitely be, don't. So this is great. new. Yeah. All right. So shotgun question number one: What is your favorite cheat meal? My favorite cheat meal? Mm -hmm. Oh, easily chicken cheesy gordita crunch from Taco Bell with three fire sauce. Wow, that's the most specific answer I think we've gotten. I. It's not the most specific, but it's it's up there. Yeah, that's that's it's one of the more unique answers. It's really good. Cheesy chicken gordita. No, it's it, they're <laughs> chick they're. Cheesy gordita crunch, but I yeah. prefer chicken to beef. Oh, okay. it's like great e meat. So the cheesy gordita crunch is money. I won't lie. Oh, so I get that every you time. You gotta get I go. four fire or three fire sauce though on each. Not that I eat more than I one. Never do the fire sauce. <laughs> yeah, I never do the fire sauce. 
three fires. Why is it really? three? Yeah. What's I, what's I, you sriracha, asked me my favorite you're cheat You're a sriracha meal. guy. I thought you would have done the fire sauce. I just don't think about it. <laughs> I forget that they have that stuff. Yeah, I but don't. Why is it three fire? Like that's you're what I like. I've tried three one. I've tried two. Fires <laughs> on I rip them all open at the same. You said cheat meal, all right? Stop shaming whoa, me for my whoa. cheat meal. No, no, no. I am. I'm, I'm understanding. This is not shame. I cannot shame. <laughs> you no, know, he wants to know. So yeah, can do I'm it, so. enlightening me. Yeah. <laughs> I also, I also do enjoy a bit, that, and this is something I really like, but um, a really good. Uh, roast beef sandwich like a hot roast beef sandwich like a, with au jus How's that a, that's, not au jus. Cheat, that's not a cheat meal well the yeah. bread might be yeah the bread and I like mine with cheese on it and it's horseradish so horseradish right. is fine I respect that so what's question number two well you don't have you're not like an exercise expert so I'm gonna switch this up for you okay I'm gonna ask you what is your favorite theory in psychology my favorite theory in <laughs> psychological types, the theory of psychological types. Okay. Boom. Carl Jung. And and break it down just a little bit further and perhaps say why that's your favorite. I know we kind of discussed on it, but like really what really grabs it for you? Because I think that it's for me personally and what I've seen, I find it to be the most telling in a way that when understood can be applicable in people's lives. Okay. If that, without getting into, <laughs> it's a very robust theory. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think that there's very usable tools when you understand which cognitive functions are present in in your psyche and that you're using most often. I think it's usable. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Fair <man>. enough. <laughs> All right. What is your Briar, uh, Briggs Myers type? My Myers Briggs type. And Myers Briggs. Yeah, I, I switched it up. I don't care. It's all <laughs> also the same known to as me. the MBTI. Yeah, I think yeah. I interchanged it here. Um, yeah. I have a preference for ENFP, which ENFP. is extroversion, intuition, feeling, and perception. If you could be <laughs> any type, what would it be? ENTJ. Okay. Which is extroversion, intuition, what do you thinking. What do you admire intuition. about the the functions of that? type of person um so i like <laughs> and, and i've worked with quite a few entj even though they're more of a rarer percentage of the population they are the commanders man they are typically um they're very mm -hmm. they're not fearful they're risk takers mm -hmm. um they're very very confident, stereoty they're confident. stereotypically confident. stereotypically confident are yeah. you are she asking or are you asking <laughs> <laughs> see I'm not i love i here. love hearing this though know. because you've learned this from me so i have is, yeah, so the ENTJ, um, they just, in my experience, a lot of them have a remarkable ability. Not all of them, but many of them have just a natural tendency to be able to, you know, take risks and are, be comfortable in doing so and not really let a lot of the jargon or, you know, perhaps the perceived roadblocks get in their way. They kind of just plow through, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. There's flip sides to everything, but the yes. ENTJ is probably the one that I would pick if not an ENFP. I think there's a yin and yang to all of it. But I really do, you know, I, I, I'm, I like being an ENFP. Okay. Do you think that would have changed, like, if either of those would have changed how you attack your fitness? I mean, I guess I can't say. You mean if I placed myself in the profile? If you're an ENTJ, or? you'd walk into the gym and start directing people, <laughs> like, telling them what they're doing wrong. Well, that's stereotypical, Dan, <laughs> but no. So um, my, my partner, actually, my partner, his name is Brent, and he has a preference for ENTJ, so I happen to live with one. Uh, and Oh, uh, that's where the answer came well, from. Well, <laughs> no, that probably would not be where the answer was from. But what, what I've noticed with them is when it comes to, to fitness in particular, um, they – they go for what works, you know. So my boyfriend is also interested in this, but he does Brazilian jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts. And he has basically tailored his entire fitness plan, which he I met him through actually mm -hmm. the gym. Um, he owned a CrossFit box that I worked out at years ago. We've been together for seven years. And, you know, he's got it down for him and it works. And, you know, he loves it and he goes in and he does his thing and he works his ass off and he does it well and he gets results and if he doesn't he tweaks it and fucking a yeah and it's uh yeah so that's you know i can't say for how all entjs might attack their fitness goals but i know for the one that i am most closely associated with that i live with um he's got it down i have to say and it's not it's not um you know a set routine but it, he's figured out the way to make it work for him yeah sounds like a neurotype 1a to me he's very, no i don't think so He's type A for sure. <laughs> oh, it uh, doesn't matter. All right. What do you think he is? I, I think he's, he's his own man. <laughs> Good answer. 
what is next for you <clears throat> and you know your career what do you feel like uh, what, what 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 makes you think that you're gonna you know keep going with this but also just kind of like you know how I, I guess how about this do you think now that you you know we've talked about this with fitness and everything you think you might do that kind of you know meet some people and be like be like if if say somebody listen to this podcast and they're like you know what I like the cut of her jib <laughs> Like, what did you say? The cut of her gin? Cut of her jib. jib. Oh, jib. Okay. Is this another word we've never heard? No, I know jib. I just okay. didn't hear what you said. Cut of her jib. I like the cut of her jib. Uh, I'm going to call her up. I'm going to have her assess me. Fitness, is this going to be a new possibility for you? You know, it's funny that you should ask me that because I was thinking about that the other day in preparation for this podcast. You know, I definitely have... Pers- I ask the best questions. You do. You ask very good questions. So... Um, you know, my purpose in life, and I, I use that term loosely because I think that when people talk about their purpose and their passions, I usually want to roll my eyes um, <laughs> to a certain degree. And not that I don't believe that people have them, but I think that they're overused terms. But what, where I really feel successful in life, and when I mean success, I don't mean monetarily. I mean the feeling that I get that is what I'm looking for is when I can walk next to someone and, you know, to quote Bob Dylan, as I've said that I'm a huge fan, you know, I'd lighten everybody's load if I could, you know, that's unrealistic and you can't. But so as it pertains to fitness, I personally have seen such a tremendous benefit in my own life and in the lives of the people that I'm closest to by incorporating, you know, more of a focus on, you know, health and nutrition and specifically exercise. So with my knowledge and my love of people and understanding that we all, you know, do tick differently and my belief that, you know, finding the right sort of system for you to, you know, to move your body, to become more healthy, to become more agile. I really do think that there's, there's something there. And I actually thought about maybe, you know, perhaps beta testing this with a few people that I know, just that I, you know, work out with or that I know from Orange Theory that are having some different struggles on their own. I'm no expert, but hey, I think, it, I think there's definitely something there. There's a ton of research on it right now, so... I will say she likes to help people. 2019, 2020 can be the year of the mental. And so, uh, you know, I think that you could be starting some. It could be starting something. (laughs) We could could be doing some stuff. Yeah, well, let's see. We'll see. I'm uh, if anybody's interested, reach out to me. Are you going to go work on a screenplay? So who knows? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to work on a screenplay. (laughs) Last question. Sure. Any pro tips that you want to impart upon our audience? Wow, any pro tips. Here's, I don't know that this is a tip. It's more of a, I guess, a piece of information. We want pro tips. Ah, oh, jeez, pro tips. I'm just t- teasing you. you got, <laughs> so 90, per, there was a poll conducted in 2016, and I'm going to totally, I don't have this in front it's of paraphrase. me. Paraphrase. Paraphrase. There was a poll conducted, and it was through... Stanford and it was to it was assessing the people that people's self-awareness awareness of themselves 90 percent of people believe that they are very self-aware I and disagree is that a Dunning-Kruger <laughs> effect yeah so I don't believe that 90 percent of people are self-aware I don't even believe that 90 percent of people think that they're self-aware I don't even think 90 percent of the people know what self-aware self-awareness means, means. <laughs> Of the poll, right? So <laughs> I guess my pro tip would be to check yourself. Just And, and that doesn't mean... Just, Chickity check yourself. Yeah. <laughs> check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's no, right. like j- just, you know, seek out how you could, you know, better your outcomes. And that doesn't mean... Even if you have great outcomes, I believe that connection is everything in this world. So I know that this doesn't completely apply to, uh, you know, to, to fitness, but in a way it kind of does, you know, when aligning yourself with the right trainers and whatnot. But by being able to check where you're at and, you know, what what kind of you're working with in your deck and what you don't have that maybe that you want that you need, um, I would really encourage people to just try to find out more about their own wiring. Um, and you know, if you find yourself in a situation, I guess this is a pro tip. If you are a person who often finds that things are happening to them and, you know, especially things that maybe you don't want, or if you, you know, are someone who maybe people have told you, you know, that your ego, you know, kind of has a seat at the table. And if you feel that that's maybe upset the apple cart at times in ways that maybe you wouldn't want it, 
I really encourage you to, you know, to, to dive down this path, if nothing more, to reach out to me because, you know, connection is everything and sometimes we sabotage it without even realizing it. Well said. <laughs> if your life isn't the way that you want it to be, it's on you. That means there's Talk something you don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk to somebody and let's get it figured out. Yeah, and it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean it's going to be roses and butterflies. It's not like self-awareness. Sunshine and lollipops? No, it doesn't mean that self-awareness is an end-all be-all. Rainbows but it's and a, unicorns? But it's a necessity it's not, to... It's not a... What's that thing where you're supposed to just put out into the universe and then it comes to you? And, and you're storyboard it? <laughs> Dharma? Intention? Yeah, you set your intention... And then it just happens. Yeah, that's like the beginning of the Oprah <laughs> podcast. Like, yeah, send yeah. your attention, wait for it, wait for it, and then book. let it go. I can't remember the name of the book that it's based on, but yeah. that's not what you're talking no, about. No, it's not at all what I'm talking <laughs> about. It's, it's actually right. doing the work to see if you're an asshole or not, like in different capacities so that you you can you can change. It doesn't mean you don't to it's not It's not be. all the other people whoa, whoa, whoa. if you keep running into the same pattern. Yeah. It's we you. can be assholes and still be good. <laughs> Absolutely, you can. Absolutely. So my pro tip would be, Invest I'm, in finding more asshole. about yourself, not necessarily money. I, I mean time, effort. I understand. I understand. Yeah. I'm hip. I'm cool. I'm picking that's up right. what you're putting down, and I respect that pro tip. I appreciate that, Nick. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't have a better one for you, but that's a strong you know one. That's very strong. You, you came strong-ish. <laughs> you know, I think physically you were strong. Now I'm getting a complex <laughs> about these big biceps of mine. Those Jesus. cannons helped win the American <laughs> Civil War right there. We've seen it. It was definitely there. Uh No. Great information. Thank you very much. Well, thank you guys for having me. We we might have to have a further for discussion on. upon this. I yeah, hope you we do. Your wheels spinning. Uh, we'll see. Well, Maybe. I'll welcome an opportunity to come back and talk to you guys. Yeah. Anytime, well, so. we'll see uh, how you progress. We'll definitely get feedback from the audience on this one. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see how you progress with your your experiment. My experiment with yeah. applying. We're gonna apply it to Nick. Actually, can yeah. we volunteer him to be your first? Uh... Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, is it pro bono? Because that's how I appreciate. Uh, it. I mean, he's on a good path already. So yeah. Uh... No, I uh, I give away a lot for free. Like I said, this is a my success. Unfortunately, um, doesn't come in uh, always in the form of money. But oh, yeah. I feel very now. Good. I want to figure out why Nick has latched onto yoga using type. <laughs> You're doing yoga. Mm -hmm. Good for you. It's so good for you. I think it's Mentally. a lot. Mentally, I I know I'd be better doing like strongman or power, you know, all that stuff. But I I prefer yoga. Yeah. And do you care so, to do those things? Even though you probably would be very good at them, you look. You I don't. I stuff. just. I just. Yeah. I don't. It's not like um. How about this? It's not a necessity. Yeah. But that yeah. this is why I brought it up because it's like something you never would have thought you would have loved until you had to do it for this podcast, and then you liked it. And which is what we want our audience to do more of. But I also do it because I think it's better for me in the long run. For sure. Yep. That's you great. Know. It's great. I mean, there's... I, I can almost touch certain things that I wasn't able to touch before. You know, That's so. more than I can almost. say. <laughs> almost. Almost. I'm flexible. All right. So thank you again, Sarah, for, very much. You're welcome. Uh, definitely a pleasure. You want to do it? You want me to? And thanks for listening to the Hero Fit Podcast with Nick and Dan and Sarah. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and learned some ways to improve the psychological side of your diet and exercise. One way to free up mental bandwidth is to subscribe to us so you don't have to remember to go looking for us and you'll automatically know about new episodes. So go ahead and click that subscribe button right now. And if you want to know more about this episode or listen to past podcasts, go to herofitpodcast.com where we have links, descriptions, images, and other content for you to enjoy. We'll put Sarah's website on there and you know, all of her other links and socials. Yeah, I mean, we'll put some of the books that you recommended up on there. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good idea. Don't those. threaten us with a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to help us out further, leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you can. Um, we really appreciate when people do that for us because it helps us grow. If your podcast app doesn't have reviews, print out our logo on a poster board, add five stars to it, go to your local sports sporting event, and hold it up in front of the camera. The entire broadcast. The whole time. <laughs> Get a spot want... behind the catcher. That's right. Uh, go find the news artist, like the news program that's going on on the street. We'll find, we'll know, find the latest story, yeah. Uh, run onto the field if you have to. Step down. Up. There's a personality Overnight, type that would be go. best to do that. Take it, <laughs> take it to the uh, to the border. All the out there. Take it to the border where there's the immigration camps. Because that's where all the media is right now. Oh dear. We want to talk And on that note, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of things you can do with that poster board. Stand behind the. Uh,
Democratic rally. Right. Or, or, AMC debates are coming up. Uh, lots of places. I, I appreciate it. It makes me. It makes me. Come on, Dave. Where am I on this? Uh, if you think here. someone you know would like <laughs> this episode, please share it with a friend. And let them know why. And if you're feeling frisky enough, please tell us what you would like us to talk about, what guests you'd like us to feature at. Dan? That's it for now. That's it for now. uh, Find us on social media in the meantime. That's right. Till then, keep it classy. This has been another episode of the Hero Fit Podcast. Making humans great again, one podcast at a time.